a row of hotels just off Canada's busiest highway, the 401. Police with a human trafficking unit recently focused their attention here for an investigation called Project Solstice. I can see the main entrance and the north entrance. The goal, locate women and girls who may be being held against their will and sold for sex and find the men who may have conned the women into a situation they can't get out of. And the biggest hook used is with young women is the Romeo pimp who these women end up thinking they are in a loving, caring relationship with. Last year, police with the unit helped rescue 15 women and girls from the sex trade, the youngest only 14. A couple of people are already working on the next probe we have set up. But this isn't Toronto or Vancouver, it's London, Ontario. How common is human trafficking in smaller Canadian cities and towns? And when police allow reporters to come along to see what they're up against, what are the rules? CBC reporter Kate Dubinsky wrote along with police for this story. Kate, I think people probably have this impression that human trafficking takes place in our largest cities, where, where there'd be a critical mass of people who would be willing to pay for sex. But as you showed, it's happening in all kinds of cities and towns across the country. It is, and often along the 401, because it's easy to get women and girls in and out of hotels and back on the road, which makes it much more disorienting for them. So they travel from Windsor to London to Cambridge, back to London to different cities all along the 401 corridor every day or every couple of days. And they are often recruited from small towns and forced to work in different towns so that they don't know where they are, they don't know who to reach out for help or where to run away. How are police finding these women? What are some of the tools they're using? And, and how are they able to figure out who has chosen to be a part of the sex trade and, and who's being held against their will? It's tough. It's tough for them to figure that out. Uh, they have a few investigative techniques. Uh, they might be getting tips from people or concerned parents are calling or someone who has given them a tip about a particular woman or girl. They look at ads on uh, websites where women advertise uh, sexual services. They look for signs that a woman might be trafficked. She might have bruises. She might be emaciated. Um, maybe she's not answering her own texts or um, they have all kinds of other ways of um, flags that are raised and they will pose as Johns and so they answer these ads and they go in and they speak to the, the woman or girl who, who has posted that ad uh, to see if she's there working independently or if she's being forced to do what she's doing. Now we saw you in that footage a moment ago as you're with police as they go on these stings what kinds of agreements are made ahead of, of what we refer to in the business as an access piece, where we have access to behind the scenes work, but often that comes with an understanding beforehand about what we will and won't show. It does. We want to do responsible journalism and we want to not uh, cause any further harm to the women who might be victims or women who are just doing their job working in the sex trade. So. Uh, in this case, the agreement that we made was that we would not show the officers' faces that were involved in the undercover operation because they are working undercover and so uh, their identities need to be protected. And we also agreed not to identify the women that we might come across. We told the police that we would uh, show them any pictures where they might be identified. So there's a picture of the police officer from the back. We made sure that uh, you couldn't see his face so that he wouldn't be identified. It's so important to see these stories. Thanks for talking about it. Thank you.